what I'm going to uh, attempt to talk about this evening is one of the big questions is what is mind? What is the nature of mind? This has been a preoccupation of Buddhist philosophy for a long time. And you can find, for example, in the Zen tradition, many of the koans are basically working around this more basic question, what is mind? In the Tibetan tradition, there is a lot of study of the nature of mind. For example, Padmasambhava's text of the Great Liberation begins with a series of verses giving different sort of theories of mind put out by different schools, saying that mind is the closest thing to us, but we don't understand it. And this is indeed an amazing thing. Really, the crux of it is that our mind is with us all the time. It's the most immediate, intimate part of our experience. In fact, in a sense, it's the totality of our experience. All we experience is, is in our mind, and yet it's mysterious to us. In the uh, Abhidhamma of the Theravada, all of reality is divided into four categories. There is rupa, which is physical matter, form, and um, chitta and chittasaka are two aspects of mind. And there's nibbana, the unconditioned. Chitta and chittasaka, and the word chittasaka just breaks down to uh, associated with chitta. So chitta is considered kind of primary. Chitta is the subjective aspect, and chittasaka is the objective aspect of mind. The chitta is that which knows. It's the process of experiencing, knowing, of having experience. Not knowing in the sense of understanding, but just knowing in the sense of experiencing. Right? And chittasaka is all the other processing that the mind does. That includes thinking, uh, perceiving, feeling, and so forth. These two aspects of mind are um, quite distinct in their natures. The chitta, the quality of knowing, of, of pure experience, is elusive, difficult to get to an understanding of because it's so simple. There's no structure. There's just simply the knowing. And it's immediate. Whereas chitasaka is capable of all manner of complications. We know our thoughts, our perceptions, our emotions can become quite involved. One of the uh, issues that comes up, particularly in, um, in Western philosophy, a, a big uh, issue is they call the mind-body problem is the relationship between mind and body. And generally in Western thought, there's been two, two approaches or answers to this. One is the attitude taken, or the position taken by more religious people is the ghost in the machine, it's sometimes called, is the embodied soul that there's a soul which is an independent essence that is the real being and operates the body. The opposite position is the materialist position that mind is a byproduct of physical action. And in the most up-to-date iteration of that, it's neurons firing in the brain. So it's essentially a mechanical operation biochemical, mechanical operation. The Buddhist position is uh, neither of these. A central 
teaching of the Buddha is the not-self doctrine, anatta, emptiness, sunyata. So there's no ghost in the machine. And this makes it a bit difficult, subtle to understand because we get caught up, tripped up by language, by the inevitable structure of human thought and language. I don't care what language you're using, whether it's English or Pali or Thai or whatever it may be. If you're talking about mind, consciousness, these things, we have to use nouns. It's the structure of language. But really, there's no thing there. It's not actually an object. It's a process or a verb. The knowing. And there's nobody doing it. And likewise, Buddhism is also quite distinct from the mechanistic or materialistic view. Mind is seen as something not produced by the body. It exists in a human form. It exists in a close association with the body. And the relationship between body and mind is a subtle one. There's feedback going both ways. But the mind is not the body. The body is not the mind. Some people thinking about this imagine the brain to be something like a computer and it's running a, a, a program or an algorithm, and uh, one of these is, it runs numerous algorithms, but one of these is for consciousness. But I would argue that this is not actually the case, because as I remarked at the outset, the experience of simply knowing is immediate. It's not in any sense a stepwise process. It's just, it's either there or it's not. It's simply knowing. And if it was produced as a result of some kind of a process, then we could at least in theory reduce that process to an algorithm. But for something that is innately simple and immediate, there's no algorithm behind it. And the only way a biomechanical system like the brain could produce anything is algorithmically. So it's not possible for consciousness to be a result of brain process. Just to speak my own opinion on the matter, the relationship between brain and, and mind, I think the analogy of a computer is a wrong one. I think if you're going to use a um, technological analogy for the way the brain relates to mind, I would think a radio receiver would be better. I think the brain, in relation to mind, the brain operates as an interface of mind and body. And the mind controls the firing of the neurons and allows like the, the brain to process information and the body to move its arms and legs and so on. But at the end of the chain of perception, there's that simple knowing. Yeah. And that's not in any way a process. It's just an immediate occurrence. There was a, uh, a modern Western philosopher, a fellow named Chalmers, who wrote a famous essay maybe about 20 years ago on uh, the nature of mind. This is like his big preoccupation, and uh, the title of the essay was What It Is Like to Be a Bat. And he goes through you know, the, the idea that a bat is an organism that experiences the world quite differently than a human being. They're almost blind, and they operate by echolocation. They parse the nature of their surroundings by radar, basically, or sonar. They send out little cheeps and then uh, with their mouth and then they hear the sound echoing back and they can figure out where the walls of the cavern is quite accurately. So it's an entirely different sensual experience, different sensory experience, an entirely different sense matrix than a human being. But we can sort of imagine it. And if we can't, 
imagine what it's like to be a bat, at least we can see the question makes sense. There is something that it is like to be a bat. But then if you ask the question, what is it like to be a baseball bat? That makes no sense. Because it's not nothing. It doesn't feel like nothing to be a baseball bat. You know, it's it's a, it's a it's an irrational question. Because the baseball bat is not possessed in any way of mind, but a furry bat living in a cave is. So it makes sense to try and imagine what is it like to be a bat. In living organisms and in beings, let's say in conscious sentient beings, there is this uh, final step of mind of simply knowing. The other aspects of mind, the chittasakas, I think most of those, if not all of them, can be explained algorithmically. And we do now have technology that mimics many mental processing. Like we can have um, uh, even things like uh, face recognition software. Uh, and now that police forces and things are working on and they're getting, they're still pretty rough, but they're getting better, which is a processing an image of a face and then identifying it from a database and knowing the individual. And that, that's the kind of processing we do when we see our friend's face and we recognize our friend and call him by name. The chain begins with sense experience of seeing a color and shape, which is all that the eye sees. The eye doesn't see a face, let alone Joe or Fred or Sally. It sees color and shape. And that's just raw data, information. Just like a camera sees like pixels, you know, the, the brain sees color, the, the eye and the optic nerve fires back to the brain, color and shape. And then uh, that's worked on by perception. And perception is sanya in Pali, one of the mental processes that is incorporated within chitasakas. And it's a processing of that raw information Basically, if you want to use technological terminology, it's, it's working against the uh, innate database that we've built up over the years. So first of all, it recognizes a face as a human face. And if it's someone it's seen before and it knows the name, then there's a further degree of refinement and it calls up a name. Uh, this is processing of, of information by perception. Then there's a motive aspect of mind based on Vedana, feeling. This is another processing, and it's a very rudimentary processing. It's the basis underlying of emotion, but it's, emotion is much more complicated. It starts with this base in Vedana, which is basically just liking or disliking. So you see that face, and it's some guy that's cheated you a year ago, or you still angry with them and so you know that you have a feeling of aversion or if it's your your dear friend you haven't seen in a while you, you feel happy you know, and this is the beginning and then mental processing on top of that are uh, thinking processes sankara which works it over in the mind and you know tells stories to yourself and reminisces and memories and makes connections and works over the raw material processes it further. This process of perception, there's an analogy in one of the, the old texts, I think it's in Vasudhimaga, compared different people picking up a coin. A little child picks up the coin and it's just a bright, shiny object with no association. And that's like sense impression, just these color and shape. And then an ordinary man in the marketplace picks up the coin and he knows this is a half kahapana piece. And he knows it's got a certain value. He can buy a, a bag of rice with it or whatever. Uh, a coin dealer picks it up. And he says, oh, this is a half kahapana piece minted in the reign of King Pasanadi. And it's 98% pure silver. And it's worth uh, so much more than a Magada piece. And you know he can, knows all the technicalities of it. 
And that's like the ordinary person picking it up is, is perception. It recognizes it, it knows what it is. And then the coin dealer picking it up is like thought. Thought process, sankars that come in afterwards and spin out more of a story, process it, you know, make further connections. So our mind processes all this information. But again, the key difference between us and the computer is that we are aware of that. At the end of the chain, there's a knowing, you know, this, the chitta that knows. Yeah? And when we're working with the mind, one of the key aspects is to not get lost in the processing, in the chitasakas. And this is really where we go astray, is we identify with the processing. So we're off-centered. You know? We're uh, askew in the mind. We're off-balance. You know? And we lose the sense. It's never actually gone. We can't not be conscious. We can't lose that knowing. But we lose the sense of it. And we, we kind of identify with the thoughts or with the emotions. Then we're pulled out from the center of the mind into the periphery and there lies confusion and suffering. But if we're able to center ourselves clearly in the knowing, then all the rest can happen naturally and we can be aware of it and we can work with it. Now we don't have to feel overwhelmed by it. We feel like we're in charge. And all of these processes operate according to causes and conditions. This is another central tenet of Buddhist philosophy is that nothing is arbitrary or random. Everything arises dependently arisen, conditionally arisen, according to cause and effect. So there is a pattern to it all. Now what happens with the mind uh, the mind in its totality, is that in each moment, consciousness is taking an object. This is the bare bones, raw material of human experience, is consciousness taking an object. All the rest is details. At each moment, there's consciousness and an object. And uh, there is a, a pattern to it. And this is also something that is gone into in great detail in the Abhidhamma and other texts, how we process information and what happens. And the, the mind can operate in, a, in, in each moment. It's, uh, it's, it's taking an object, but there's also an aspect of volition. There's a choice. Uh, this happens in a sequence. The, the object that's presented is a result of past causes. And then there's a moment the object is known, then there's a moment of volition as to what to do with it. You know? It's called a jawana moment. And this is when kama is made. And kama, which is action, volitional action by the mind is one of the causes that sets up the conditions for future objects to arise. So the objects which arise at any given moment are resultant, which means it's not a product of choice. This is something presented to the mind. And the mind's aware of it. But then what the mind does with it, there's a choice. This is the, the moment of freedom. And it takes some effort to exercise that freedom. I love the, uh, the image. Some of you will have heard me use it before from one of Ajahn Chah's talks. He says that in the old days in Thailand, they traveled about in ox carts. And these ox carts, they'd be pulled by water buffaloes. And they had these great big wheels, big, great big wooden wheels. 
And if you're going from one village to the next village and it's a frequented path, many people take that path over, over months and years, then these wheels will dig ruts into the ground. And you can just lay back in the cart and go to sleep if you want. And the water buffalo will even go around corners just to take the path of least resistance and uh, just follow the ruts and get you to the next village. But if you want to go to some more obscure place that people don't go very often, and there's not a path dug into the ground, you have to stop the cart, get out, unhook the water buffalo, wrestle the cart out of the, the ruts, set it up on the ground, then chase the water buffalo down who's run off to get something to eat, drag him back and tie him up and stay awake to guide him as to go all the way to the next village. So it takes quite a bit of effort to break out of the rut and do something different. So if the effort is not put in, the mind just follows along the path of least resistance. Yeah. And that's not entirely a bad thing. Because if you make the initial effort and set up good habits and good routines, then they become easier and easier. And you can follow that, that path. But if you want to, you know, break out of a rut in the mind that's not productive, it does take an effort. You have to, to you know, wrestle the cart out of the, the ditch. And this is a karma is cutting, you know, the ruts in the mind. And this is one of the one of the uh, aspects of karma. So in each moment, we're having these experiences and we're making these choices and we're, we're going along, mind taking an object. And as long as we're caught, caught in samsara, this is also one of the, the driving forces of this is desire. This is what keeps us going. The mind's desiring the next object. And associated to this idea is the nature of the objects themselves, because of conditionality, no object is perfect. So we talk about phenomena, the objects having the three characteristics, dukkha, which is suffering or imperfection or unsatisfying. The essence is that nothing is completely fulfilling or satisfying or perfect. Anicca, which is impermanence, nothing sustains, nothing lasts, and ultimately it only lasts for a moment. And anatta, uh, not self or emptiness, that things are essentially without a core essence. Nothing exists from its own side. And all of these relate to the idea that things are conditioned. They arise by cause and effect. They arise in relationship to other things. So there's no perfect, self-sustaining gem of an object out there. Right? There's one Tibetan teaching that, uh, and I'm, I've, I've thought about this, and I'm not quite sure if the logic works, but it's evocative anyway. He says that there could not possibly be a perfect object in samsara, or all the minds in the universe would eventually find it and cease to move forever and the universe would have ceased to exist long ago. Yeah. So it's the, kind of the driving driving energy under everything is this desire, yeah, the hunger or thirst for, for taking the, the perfect object. Yeah. And this is how the mind works in samsaric mode in, in practice. You know, This is happening all the time. And I can kind of see where this Tibetan idea comes from because there's also on a more kind of uh, ontological or metaphysical level, there is a sense in which a mind generates the, the universe. Certainly, subjectively, the, the universe we experience and we live in is a product of our mind. Uh, this is something useful to, to understand, to cut through kind of naive realism we're not experiencing the universe directly. We're getting signals, limited 
a limited stream of data through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body from the outer world. And it's it's limited. You know, like the, the eyes can only see a narrow band of electromagnetic radiation. Eyes can't see radio waves, for example, and radio waves are everywhere, in a, particularly in a city. We can only see this narrow band of visible light. And the same with hearing. We can only hear a certain range of frequencies. So we get these limited signals coming in from the outer world, and then perception and sankaras and feelings, they work on the signals and they create a simulation of the outer world that we can experience. So the, the world we actually experience is a mental creation. It's not to say that the outer world is unreal, but just that we don't ever directly access it. All we access is our own mind's reflection of that. And that can be flawed. It can be flawed in a number of ways. And we can have a deficiency in one of the sense organs, temporary or permanent. Or we can have a deficiency in the processing. And that's when people have uh, hallucinations. And they, this uh, information coming in is processed in in a capricious way. You can see this quality of the mind creating a world in, in dreams. When we dream, we're not so constrained by incoming signals. But the same processing is going on, the same kind of processing. We're just more free to create a world to live in. I've had the idea that in the higher realms of being, in the Dewa world, that degree of freedom of processing is somewhere in between our waking and dreaming states. That they're somewhat limited by incoming signals, but less so than we are. So their world can be more fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, and this ability of the mind to create a world, this also has a resonance with modern physics, uh, thinking about... Um, the quantum mechanical idea of a, of a wave function. That reality independent of the observer is just a field of possibilities. An electron doesn't exist at a point. It exists as a, as a mappable fuzzy area around the nucleus of the, uh, the atom with a, a degrees of probability of being at different points. Until the experimenter makes an experiment and, and determines the position of the electron, then the wave function is said to collapse and it's manifested as a point. So the entire world is essentially these range of probabilities. And it's only when it's known by mind that it becomes reduced to a, a single occurrence. So I find that idea has a, has a strong resonance with the underlying philosophy and the Buddhist nature of mind of how the mind is a creative element in the world. In fact, the mind is said to be primary. It's the very first verse of the Dhammapada. It's, mind is the forerunner, mind is the chief. The body follows the mind like the cart follows the ox. Which turns around the, um, I think the, the modern bias is to think of, of matter as primary and that mind is a secondary occurrence of, from matter. And I've sometimes heard the argument made by materialistically minded persons that, well, the universe existed for a while before any kind of life evolved and there was any mind at all. But then there's no, there's no um, explanation given or possibility of an explanation for 
why the universe came into the being in the first place. Right? Of course, in the theistic model, it's because God did it. Right? God, God made the universe. But then that raises further questions. Of, you know, uh, where did God come from? And you know, why is not the universe perfect if, if God is perfect? And so forth. The view in Buddhism and also in, in other Eastern thought like Taoism and Hinduism is that the universe is beginningless as well as endless. It's cyclical. So any given world system at any scale, and it happens at different scales, when it ceases to exist, when it runs out of juice, in our modern science we'd say like when the sun uses up all its hydrogen and burns out, it'll be the end of the solar system. But the process of cause and effect doesn't end. And the beings that existed in that system when they die, when any individual dies, the process of mind is not broken if there's still desire and karma operating. If they're an arahant, they get out of the game altogether. But if there's still this process of coming into being, this urge to come into being, then the, the being will arise again in another form. And this makes sense as a necessity if you look at it in the opposite direction. You look backwards. Like each moment of consciousness was conditioned by the previous moment throughout your life. So the first moment could not have arisen in a out of nothingness. It had to also have its prior causes. So each moment conditions the next. And... When a, a world system, whether it's a solar system or a galaxy, you know, to use modern terminology, when that ceases to be, the beings that had existed, they're all dead, but they had still karma outstanding, so that their karma then is the force that propels the arising of a new universe for them to, to live in. This idea is not you know, not my own invention. This is this is the idea of the cyclical world systems in the old classical cosmology. That when a world system comes to an end, the new one is arisen by the power of the kama of all the previous beings. Because the kama compels that consciousness to have an experience, and it no longer has a vehicle it can experience in. It has to manifest a vehicle. So underlying all of this is the idea that mind is primary, that mind precedes and is a causative factor for everything else. And everything else is secondary to that simple experience of knowing. That's the basic core reality of the universe, is, is conscious knowing. Everything else is peripheral to that. So in terms of our own practice and experience, the uh, effort should be to try and find that and to live in that, know that, center yourself in that, be that knowing. Okay, so we'll break for tea and then do questions and answers.